And hello everybody, thank you so much for coming here. Um, the Woodstock Film Festival, which is now in, 18, in its 18 years, and um, one of our bigger supporters from every, every, ever since year one, ever since 2000, has been BMI. And there's a f big focus in the festival ever since year one, which is focus on music. Of course, we are in Woodstock, so it's sort of a no-brainer that film and music for us are very important, the intersection between the two. And um, this every year we bring you panels that focus on different aspects of music and film. Each time it's totally different. And this year it's specifically about one film, Symphony of Hope, which has first shown yesterday and again will show tomorrow. And it's this wonderful film. And the panel will talk to you all about it. I want to bring the various elements, the various creators of Symphony of Hope along with the vice presidents of film and television for BMI and one of my long time and closest friend, Doreen Ringer Ross, who has been with us, like I said, since the year 2000 and going strong. I love this woman. So Doreen Ringer Ross, please come and join us. And we would like to bring all the panelists here to join us as well. Come on in, everybody. Come on in. And Doreen will make the introductions uh, for each one of you. So Brian, you're sitting here. And Lucas, right here. Yeah. So thank you all for being with us. And thank you for coming to see um, the Symphony of Hope panel. Take it, Doreen. Thank you. And thank you for creating this incredible festival. I just, it's my favorite. And I hope you guys are having a good time. So we're going to get right to it. And I think um, rather than me trying to select from various bios the choicy nuggets to disclose, I'm going to ask all of you to go ahead and say your name and what you did on this particular film, and then give us a couple of sentences about your basic uh, career so that they understand what you exactly do. Chris Brooks. Uh, I'm Chris Brooks. <laughs> If you hadn't figured that out. Uh, I was the music editor on this uh, project. Uh, slightly different uh, job. I mean, I'm often a music editor, but this was a slightly different job than usual. Uh, and also an amazing you know, work of passion. Uh, I edit and produce uh, film music for film and television, have for many years. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I worked with Michael Kamen for 25 years, so I did all of his big you know, blockbusters and little teeny European movies. Um, and did a few, few highlights, or like Goodfellas I did. And um, I suppose the thing that I'm most proud of is that I was the uh, music supervisor and music editor on Mr. Holland's Opus. Yay. 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 Chris Leonard. Uh, my name's Chris Leonard. I'm a, I am a film composer. Uh, and uh, this was kind of my brainchild. I, uh, Not kind of. It was my brainchild, okay. um, and as you guys uh, will hear, I, uh, I started this project because one of my dear childhood friends, uh, it was actually our childhood priest, um, moved to Haiti about 30 years ago and started a charity uh, in a slum outside of Port-au-Prince, which feeds about 4,000 people a day, and, uh, and then expanded and has schools and, uh, and digs wells and clinics and all the kind of stuff, and he's really uh, amazing. And, and when, the when the earthquake hit, um, I felt like we needed to do something. We didn't know if he was even alive. So, uh, so that's why I started this thing, and you'll hear much more about that. Uh, but my day job, again, is, uh, is writing music for movies and, and TV. And uh, I met Chris working with, uh, for Michael Kamen a long time ago on 101 Dalmatians, the movie. And, uh, and since then, do all kinds of uh, all kinds of stuff. I, I do a lot of comedies like uh, Horrible Bosses and uh, Ride Along and things like that. And, and Sausage, Sausage Party, Party which Chris and I did together. I can say Sausage Party. We saw Sausage Party. Um, as well as some... Top uh, of my resume. Exactly. Always. <laughs> as well as uh, indie stuff like uh, Adam and Thanks for Sharing and uh, some TV stuff like Marvel's Agent Carter and things like that. So, there you go. I'm Lucas Richman. I'm the conductor for the CD and then the subsequent documentary, Symphony of Hope. Um, I, I teach a 
a workshop for film com uh, com composers to teach them how to conduct, and I've been doing this for 20 years through BMI, and that's where I first met Chris. Uh, you were my first workshop? Yep. Yeah, first, first year, one. 20 years ago. Um, wow. So it was a, 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 an honor <coughs> to, to be brought on to this project. Um, I'm music director for the Bangor Symphony Orchestra in, uh, in Bangor, Maine. Um, and at the time of the recording of this, I was also in uh, my tenure, 12 years as uh, music director for the Knoxville Symphony in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. I also keep my uh, uh, fingers in the film community because I've conducted numerous film scores and I write films, uh, film scores, and uh, as well as a lot of concert works. Hi, <clears throat> I'm Brian Weedling. Um, I was the director and producer of this film. I was the lucky one who was handed this beautiful piece of music and then from there was able to try to find footage and uh, visuals to do justice to how beautiful the music was. And my back, uh, background is in documentaries. I've been making documentaries since early 2000s. I did one on the captain of the US soccer team, Claudia Reyna. A um, few years ago, I did a film called Speak, which followed people that were competing to be the world champion of public speaking. And, uh, and then this has been my, my last opus. I've been uh, working on this really since 2011 is when we, when we did the, uh, the recording. So I was handed the footage, you know, that we, we brought in a, a film crew of about 50 people that came in to record this one day of music. And, uh, and at the end of that, I was handed a couple hundred hours of, uh, of performance footage uh, from all these different camera angles. And then spent the next six years, both myself and uh, about a dozen other filmmakers going over to Haiti. Most of the filmmakers that I found were going to work with another organization in Haiti. And I said, hey, while you're there, could you find me this shot and this shot? And if you see this, make sure you get a shot of that and send it to me. And that's how we started to piece this together. And one of the reasons why it took six years, the, the other is you know, we were sort of doing this between our regular day jobs and other projects. Um, but it really came down to Chris, every time I would show him another cut, and you know, it would be about every 18 months or something, I'd show him a cut and he'd go, all right, it's, it's kind of looking pretty nice. And I'd, and I'd know when he said that, I'm like, all right, we're gonna dig deeper, we're gonna keep going. And, uh, <laughs> and we, we kept doing that for several years until we, we finally got down to the last strokes of, of what it needed and, and then went from there. Chris Leonard, since this was your brainchild um, predicated on your relationship with Father Tom, do you want to just explain for those who may not have seen the film yet uh, uh, and just in general, what your concept was? What is Symphony of Hope and, and how did it percolate up out of your brain and manifest? Absolutely. So um, the Symphony of Hope is, I, I was, it was about three days after the earthquake had happened and I had talked to my, my mom and dad who were still currently living back east at the time and no one had heard from Father Tom and, and we didn't know whether he was alive or not and, and obviously we'd seen all the destruction. And so I just started thinking, well, they're gonna need so much. I mean, first of all, Haiti's the poorest country in the Western hemisphere uh, and, and they always need help, but, but this was gonna be a terrible, terrible, uh, tragedy, and so I started thinking, well, how can we how can we raise some money and also raise awareness? And and um, so I came up with this. I don't really re remember the exact moment, but I came with, up with this idea to have a lot of composers that I'm there. There were my colleagues um, write a piece together, and then quickly I said, well, it's it's, our, it's actually got got to be based on something Haitian. So I, I did a bunch of research, and I found a uh, folk song called Wangalo which uh, is a famous Haitian folk song that I thought was very beautiful. And, um, and it, it had some, some, uh, some real relevance because it was talked about um, finding beauty in, in things that aren't always beautiful or finding um, hope in things that seem like they're hopeless. Um, so I, I decided that we had to write this symphony together. And so I started asking everybody and I asked, uh, you know, Ton, tons of people and you know people like Dave Grusin who you know wrote the score for Goonies and Milagro Beanfield War right and has an Oscar in many things and Marvin Hamlish uh, said yes and and um, uh, Tyler Bates who did Guardians of the Galaxy and Bruce Broughton who got an, had an Oscar for Silverado all these amazing amazing writers and they all they all said yes and they said they want to be involved and then I kind of went well geez how are we gonna do this and so I came up with the concept of attacking it like, I think we used to call it whisper down the alley or, or that kind of thing where we would, 
or, or whatever it was in, in high school where they would say, you write a sentence in a story, pass it to the next desk, and then someone will write the next sentence. I said, why don't we do the, the symphony that way? So I took the first, um, the first piece of music, which was this folk song, and I gave it to George Clinton, who, who did Austin Powers and a bunch of other things, and I said, okay, George, you start. He wanted to start. So he, everyone said, we'll do 24 to 48 bars each and pass it along. And then as soon as we got that piece, we passed it to the next composer. And beyond that, all we had was a relative, you know, uh, Lucas brought the score, and we actually came up with the, uh, the um, chapters, the, uh, the movements. Um, we decided the first one was gonna be just the prologue, which actually is the presentation of, the, of the, um, the, the folk song. And then we said the second one would be destruction, which would have some sort of relationship or description musically about the actual earthquake. Uh, the third one, uh, Hymn for Haiti, which was sort of about uh, the aftermath. Um, and then there's A New Dawn and Finale and Hope. Um, so it was supposed to sort of tell this story in a programmatic, programmatic fashion. Um, uh, of that, so we started assigning to whoever was available in between their day jobs of, of doing this music, who of, of doing their music for their movies. We said, you know, you take the next step and 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 work from there. And so it really became a chain letter um, in, in that sense. And it took about 16, 18 months to actually finish the entire symphony. And then we uh, we. I called and begged and groveled, and I got uh, the Warner Brothers gave us their scoring stage uh, for free and their crew for free, and we made deals with uh, uh, the singers uh, and SAG, we made deals with the Musicians Union, and we basically got everyone to donate their time for free to record this with the idea that we would then put out a CD, which we did um, through Network Records and and the year and late. the point was to make a CD that would that was the original point. sell as a fundraiser yes. for Haiti. Okay, that was the original point. And you would pass this along, the, the, sequentially. So the first cue was recorded, for or was demoed first, and then handed off to the next yeah. person like a chain letter. Exactly. So the second composer could hear at least what he was attaching to. Mm -hmm. He or she. There Maybe, are two yeah. female composers are, yeah. you used in this. Um, you want to elaborate a little bit on, on what that process was, that chain letter kind of process? Absolutely, but I all, yeah, what, what I said to everyone was very vaguely, okay, so here's where, here's where we are in the movement of the piece. We're, if for example, we're in, the, um, in the, the hope section. Here's what's come before you. Here's, you know, and it was synthesizer demos, so you could hear what was going on. And, 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 but beyond that, I really wanted people to write what was in their heart. I wanted them to, you know, do some research on Haiti, do some research on what's happened with the earthquake and, and, and the emotions of all that, and then just go from there. And, and then they passed that back. And I, and did I kept, you send them you know, any visual material to feed off of? I did not. We did not send any visual material at all. Um, I kind of did, we are, because that's what we do, we write to picture. I, I kind of felt like we didn't want to do that because that's what we always end up doing. And I, and I feel like we should really write from within. So, Brian, in the film where all of those incredible visuals seem to match up so brilliantly with the music, was it you cut or you had it cut to music after it was done? Yeah, so ah. you know, nor normally when I go make a film, I spend years in an edit room to tell a story. Right. And then I'll call Chris and say, Chris, will you hook me up and you know, give me a a score for almost no money. And, uh, and every time I do that, you know, Chris or one of the guys in his world um, will take this and they'll make what I was trying to tell as a story so much more beautiful through the music. Right. And this was the total opposite of that. Right. I got the beauty up front and then I was like, wow, uh, you know, what am I gonna say? And how am I gonna say it to match what this music is? And the first decision that I made in the creative process was that I was not gonna put any other uh, either words or voice or even sound effects that would interrupt the music. And there were times when I'd look back and I'd go, you know what, at that point I might have tried to do something, but I just felt like the music needed to sit and the visuals stand for themselves, but without sort of intercutting and, and right. confusing what you were hearing, just let the music really stand for itself. So that was right. sort of the first creative decision I made. And then after that, it was, it was really, it was, well, the first thing we did actually was <clears throat> we had to sync all the footage. 
And so when we shot it, you know, we came in, I mean, Chris and I had our first conversation about a month before they actually recorded. And then about a week before he said, so you ready, you know, bring a couple cameras in and I said, great. And I said, you know, me and my DP will meet you over at the Eastwood soundstage, take a look at it. And we walked in and the room was like so huge. And I looked at Ed and Ed Gutentag was like, yeah, we're gonna need more than a couple cameras here. And, and how many pieces were in the orchestra and the choir? I mean, what was the size of the population? In it, the, it was in a the 90 piece room? choir, uh, like 90, or, piece. Or, uh, 90 piece orchestra and a 60 piece choir. Um, plus, how many other people did you guys have on your side there? Like another almost hundred that were running around and doing stuff that And they were all the composers in the, in the sound. Right, <laughs> and, the, and the composers. So, like that day, I think there were like 270 people yeah. that showed up, all <laughs> giving their time for free, including 50 people that had been called within two days to bring a camera and do what, you know, help out however you can help out. So we had... Who were those 50 people with cameras? Oh, I wish I, wish I could remember all their names. Were but they friends of yours or actual they, cameramen? Most of, most of them, I give credit to Ed Gutentag that they were friends of Ed's, of projects he'd worked on. He just sort of put out the call and, you know, it's really interesting to see that there's certain people that can just make one phone call and it just steamrolls until all of a sudden there's 50 names that we got to get on the lot that day. Right. And, uh, you know, once, once we... we got back with all that footage, it was shot on reds, it was shot on 5D, so there were all sorts of different technical details to work with as far as getting into post-production. And the first one was that the red cameras don't actually have microphones on them. And a lot of guys that shoot with reds, they just know that they're gonna sync sound so they're waiting for a clapper. So everyone that showed up with it with a red is expecting that there's gonna be clappers and we'll have a little moment before <laughs> the next song starts and like immediately, Everybody realized, like, no, just hit start on your camera, roll, and we'll figure it all out later, which meant that we then had to figure out how to sync the sound where there's no reference at all. Oh and it ended up being that I had, that summer I had two interns that were both guys that had just gotten out of the Marines, had both served in Iraq, and were going to school in Ohio, wanted to be filmmakers, and... I said, all right, well, I've got the worst thing that you could ever have to deal with. <laughs> and and these, these two guys like stayed up for like a week and a half straight figuring out, first of all, they found a clock in the one corner of one of the shots and they used that and they pulled out the shot so they could see what time it was and then made a mathematical computation from that to figure out where all the other footage lay. Oh my and God. And then after they did that, it took another four weeks to then actually sync one layer of footage of performance just to have something as a baseline to work with. And then we had eight other cameras that we were then trying to see what matched those spots. And, you know, we were always trying to see if there was more material from the performance that we could use just to have that before we then started talking with filmmakers to go over to Haiti. Were, so, were so, all these cameras just kind of rogue shooting or did you assign them all? Yeah, we, assigned them, an, we assigned them an area and said, yeah. you know, when something's happening in your area, just go for it. And, you know, somebody, somebody's on Lucas all day long, so I have every moment of Lucas that entire day, every, every sneeze and nose pick and, you know, and, 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 yeah, and, you know, I did a pretty good job editing most of that out. Uh, that yes, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but it was, you know, it was, it was an arduous technical process to have something to then say, all right, well, what do we want to do with this creatively? And then it became, you know, this search for the right piece of footage. And, you know, we started out with stuff. And, you know, like as Chris said, every, every time I would bring it back to him, yeah, it was better. There was more footage, but there wasn't enough or it wasn't the right footage for that. We were trying to extend footage to make it seem like it worked. But eh, if you really step back and look, it didn't work. And so, you know, we just kept digging and digging. And, you know, Chris was very patient through the whole process with me. I mean, he basically sort of let me go and said, would well, give me a call every six months. Hey, how we doing? Is everything going okay? You still working <laughs> on it? We still working on Symphony of Hope? And, uh, and it, it was because of that that I was able to have the space and the creative space to be able to start to solve the problems of what was there. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, as far as artistic endeavors, it's probably at this point my most favorite that I've had in my life, both because of the artistic um, sort of problem solving that was involved in it and also because the moment that we, I walked in the room that day and I'm sure these guys all felt that same thing but when you walked in there and you felt like you were one of 300 that's all trying to do something like 
this just felt like so much bigger than me and so much bigger than, mm. than my goals and dreams and ambitions. And it just felt so good. And it's like, of all the experiences in Hollywood, I'd say that was, mm. that day was one of the most satisfying mm. experiences I've had out in LA. Lucas, what was it like for you from the point of view of being on the podium and conducting all of this? I mean, with all those cameras and all those people, what, how did you even organize doing that? One thing that's not really f captured or, or focused on in the film is the fact that um, behind the orchestra, there was a steady stream of photos of the devastation and the pain that was that, that um, the people of Haiti had experienced. Who put that together? Um, I did. Okay. So, so for s the entire duration of the recording session, I was staring at this. Oh wow! Right. So uh, I it, did it really just for you too. Okay. Like, <laughs> you're on the mind. It's just the like, back of everybody else. Uh, it, it was. Uh, yeah, I, I was. It, it was just. It was so moving throughout the day. And it was a constant reminder why we were there, um, uh, and and a, it there's a there's a um, a person in the film that comes out a, a, a Jimmy, um, uh, a Haitian um, uh, musician uh, musician who sings in the in the in the film, and he talks about how important the um, music is to to bring us out of the pain. Um, and and I uh, elaborate on that idea that um, when in the face of tragedy, the things once we establish uh, food and shelter and water, the thing that brings back our humanity is the music. When somebody can turn on the radio, or um, uh, and and in this case, for us to be able to um, provide music and 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 help people who are thousands of miles away. In, in some capacity, it was it was really one of the more overwhelming things I've ever done in my life, um, and and to have the film community, music community, come together in this way was so beautiful and touching. Um, I, I I was just overwhelmed. How did all of these pieces fit together? I know in the film, um, who was it that said there was something telepathic going on that Don, they thought it Don was Davis. going to be a mishmash of a bunch of pieces and Don it ended Davis. up, who said that? Don Davis. Don Davis, very articulate, but, but he's right. You know, it all sort of amazingly enough fit together. Was that innate or was that your genius as an editor or no. um, how did you make all of that form this kind of continuity? I think it was the geniuses of the composers. Uh, maybe it was because some of them have had to replace scores, <laughs> and so they were able to write in the style of. But uh, no, my job was unique on this film. I got to sit in the, in what I normally do, is sit in the control room uh, and make sure in amongst the chaos uh, that we actually recorded, got all the bits. And that was, and then I, took all of that and put it together and handed the movements off. We had five different mixers, so I handed them completed pieces. But it was, um, for me, uh, and I, I think most people didn't realize it because there were so many things going on that day, and there were composers coming in and out and looking at scores, and, and, and everyone was trying to do this, and I just focused on the score to make sure that we had every single bar and as good as it could possibly be. Uh, I wanted to mention one thing, by the way. Um, these musicians and composers are coin-operated, and the fact that they filled this room uh, for nothing is, as far as I know, a first. Musicians don't play for free, except for maybe for their family, and even then, I'm not sure. And. Uh, and certainly these composers are, you know, some of these people make a million dollars a score. So maybe they can afford to work for free from time to time, but believe me, they don't. What do you think inspired them to, to be giving like that? Chris. <laughs> Chris. I, I'm good at guilt. I, obviously, I, I grew up Italian Catholic, so uh, I'm really good at making people people feel like they they have to do it. But but really, really to the to, I think I mentioned to you the other day, uh, you know, nobody said no, 
couple people said, I'm, I'm literally in Europe. I can't do it now. Can I do it late? You know, you know, after, and we, we just ran out of time, but not, no, there's, there was nobody I, re I reached out to. I mean, you know, Hans Zimmer emailed back, he wanted to do it and he was somewhere else. He was, you know, if we could have waited three more weeks for the session, he would have done it too. It really was this situation where everyone just said, sure, I'm well, in. Well, Chris, Chris gave us an opportunity. He gave hundreds of people an opportunity to be a mensch. <laughs> and and that, was, that was the thing. It was like, um, we, we all saw the news and none of us thought of what could we do. We had no idea what, what could we do. And, and you made it happen. You solved the problem. Yeah. Well, I think the other thing too, with the, for us. to your earlier question about why it sort of sounds cohesive, cohesive I think there's something interesting in that and this plays into what Lucas was saying about music being the answer to emotion and what we as film composers do is, I mean, the reality of our job is not that we write scary music or funny music or romantic music. The reality is we need to write music that all of you will think is scary or funny or romantic. So when you get a, a, an instruction that says, here's the piece of music that you're following. By the way, it's about the aftermath of the earthquake that just killed a hundred and however many thousand people. Um, and was they- Was it 400,000 people? Was that the number? I, I think eventually it became that yeah. once you added in cholera and everything else. But so there's a reality to what does that mean to people? What does that mean to an artist, to a, to a creative person? What, it, what does that sound like? And it's not in a vacuum. It has to do with the last hundred, centuries and centuries of culture of what, you know, what means heroism, what means hope, what means tragedy, what means um, uh, you know, pain musically and how is that translated? And I think there is a universa universality to that um, that that we all know as composers and musicians, and as Lucas is watching the screen, there's a there's a, a feeling of like, okay, I know what that needs to now be. Um, so I think I think that's one of the reasons it sounds like a whole is because as humans, we know what sad sounds like or feels like, and we know what loneliness feels like, and we know what just sheer terror feels like, and there's a there's a co commonality to all that that allows us to do what we do, but it allowed us to to take this thing and that's that's starting in pieces and still make it feel like it had an arc, it had a story arc to it. Right. In the film, both you and Father Tom talk about your motive for doing any of this. In his case, he's talking about why he lives in Haiti and why he does this. And in your case, there was a beautiful sort of confessional towards the end of the movie where you reassess what you thought your motive was and what it turned out to be. Do you want to articulate about that? Yeah, so I think, I mean, I, I don't doubt that at the beginning I felt like I just was helpless and I wanted to do something to help people, but as it became a humongous undertaking, and as I was, you know, sort of involved in it and seeing why I kept going and why I kept putting energy into it, you know, I, I kind of said something that I didn't know Father Tom had said, but I didn't know if I was helping, but I know I felt better making the effort. And so there was a sort of this selfish, uh, you know, self-serving part of this, which I, I really think that there's, there is some you know, there is some, something beautiful about charity that's, that gives back to the person being charitable where, right. you know what, you feel better right. when you're doing something, when you're, when you're paying attention to and empathizing with other people. Um, and so, yeah, there is some, there's part of it that's not just about helping them. It's about helping me feel like the only thing I do every day is help people chuckle at Jennifer Aniston. That's not, that's not really enough to make a life out of. Do you so. think your fellow composers and all the other artists that were contributing their efforts to this kind of shared in that? It, it seemed like it was a really special day. I, I, there was a lot of tears. There was a lot of really, 
you know, there was a lot of just hugging and, and s smiles and somber. You know, I think everyone felt very grateful for what they have, um, grateful to be a part of it. I felt like there was a lot of really, you know, everyone I talked to sort of said the same thing you guys did, which is that it was one of the best days of their life. Right. And one of the most important days of their life. And what Father Tom says in the film, for those of you who hadn't seen it, was he, you know, he thinks every day of, you know, I've lived in Haiti for, you know, he'd lived in Haiti for, you know, 25, 30 years, and you still look around and there's just nothing but raw sewage everywhere. And there are kids who are literally eating mud patties that have been baked on concrete because that was the only, it's the only way they can fill their stomach. There's just nothing, there's nothing yeah. nutritional. It's just, that's all there is. Okay. And it's, I mean, it's just terrible. And so he said, well, I'm not helping. Nothing's changed. It's just as poor and, and, and corrupt and miserable as it was before. What, what am I, what's the point? Um, and it's Jimmy who really articulated it so well. And then Brian and I put in that Dr. Seuss quote, which is to, you know, to the world, or to one, to the world, you may just be one person, but to one person, you may be the world. And that is what I think, that's a perfect example of Father Tom and, and, and Doug Campbell, who run hands together, they found this kid at 10 years old who was running errands for, for drug smugglers and, and gang, gang members and gun runners. And they gave him a job. No, they gave him school first. They gave him school, they gave him school first, and then they gave him a job. And now he, you know, he ended up stealing uh, bicycle brake, uh, brake wires because he didn't have guitar strings. But he, he put those on his guitar and started literally playing in the streets. And he's the one who said, after the earthquake, I strung my guitar with, with brake wires and just started playing a folk song. And all of a sudden, all these orphans who were literally, who had lost everything, they were smiling again. Right. And if that's not if that's not a reason, then, into their life. yeah. Then um, what is? I, I, I actually I, I couldn't get him to say this on camera properly, <laughs> so I couldn't use it in the film. But he also didn't start playing music until after the earthquake. So mm -hmm. he had gone to one musical theory class at school four months before the earthquake happened. The earthquake happened, and he says. I need to try to play this guitar right. yeah. and taught himself how to play the guitar and started singing songs in the streets to try to right. uplift others. And so music yeah. became yeah. the way out of yeah. tragedy. Yep. Um, let's talk about the other footage that, that is the movie that is so gorgeous and so important that you actually shot in Haiti, not just the day in the studio. Right. You want to talk about your journey to Haiti and how you made all that happen? Um, well, it, it started first with me just sending other filmmakers there. I was actually finishing another film and sort of doing its little tour. And so at the beginning of this, I was like, I'm not the guy to go to Haiti. And so for two years, it was other filmmakers that I could sign up along the way that were going to work with another organization. And they would just bring me back their footage. And I'd look through and say, oh, this five minutes will look great. This will look great. And so would borrow basically their stuff. And I'd put it into this line. And after doing that for about two and a half years, I then realized, OK, now it's time that I have to go. Um, part of it was that I needed to have my feet on the soil to fully understand what I was actually doing. Right. Um, the other part of it was I kind of thought that if I made a film about Haiti and never gone there, it'd be kind of a fraud. Right. So I kind of thought that there needed to be some authenticity from that standpoint. Um, and when I got there, I went there with uh, a friend of mine named Oscar Gubernati, who had started JPHRO with Sean Penn when the earthquake happened. He had done disaster relief in New Orleans after Katrina and before that in Sri Lanka. Um, and so him and Sean had worked together for a while. And, when I had to go over there, I said, you know, you've been there, you know the landscape, you know, will you come over with me and help me out? And so he set up all my, my drivers, my security. We had, you know, locked and loaded guns on holsters at all times, wherever we went. And on... What was your biggest threat coming from? The biggest threat was coming from anywhere you weren't looking. That's... It was... Like someone's gonna take a baseball bat and hit you upside the head. Just take your take your thirty thousand dollar camera and go sell it for ten dollars on the next corner. Mm -hmm. So it was like six three white guy walking into Haiti. Everybody's about this tall, and you're holding a camera on your shoulder. Everybody's looking at you, and they're wondering what you're doing. And people in Haiti 
don't like to be filmed. Um, I think that they feel exploited and ostracized both from when the earthquake happened and just, the, especially the people in City Soleil, they really don't like to be filmed um, because they feel that you're going to exploit them for their horrible conditions and that you're going to go make money off of this and it's going to go to somebody else and it's going to lie in somebody else's pocket. So you really got Had that. Had that happened to them before? Are there instances? I, you I think it, I think it does. I think it does. Uh, you know, although it's not like we go out and see all these films about Haiti that have happened that you know have made people lots of money, but in their perception of it, these people come from the outside. They take some pictures. They go away, and they're still getting food on their table. And it didn't put any food on my table. So there's this distance that you sort of have to keep a little bit. Um, in some places, I was with Father Tom and he would actually have to call ahead to the gang leaders to get permission for us to drive down those streets and let them know that we were gonna be coming with a, a film crew, and then they'd kind of like let some of the kids come around. But it was, like, it was like orchestrated by the gang leaders, so there was nothing that didn't happen on any of those blocks in City Soleil that wasn't authorized by the guy who owned this block, and it was literally like a block by block thing as far as how much access that you could get to any area. So that's you know, one of the reasons why you'll see a lot of shots that are like drive-by shots in the right. film. And it's because that's the safest shot to get. Right. Um, sometimes you don't even put the, uh, put the window down. You just shoot through the window, which I, most of that footage I ended up getting rid of just because you know, I'd see the glare and go, no, we got a better shot than that. So right. push that to the side. But it was, um, it was the closest that I've ever felt to like being in a war area and I made I made the conscious decision a long time ago to not be a documentary filmmaker that was going to go into war areas. I right. kind of thought I'd been maimed enough in life and didn't need bullets whizzing by my head or anything like that. Um, so while I was over there, yeah, it, was, it felt very anxiety riddled the whole time. You're looking over your shoulder at every moment. When the driver said, get back in the car now, you did not ask a question. You got back in the car, and we'd be off and out of that area so fast. He'd, he'd say, some guy was looking at us. Uh, it, wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna be good. And you just believed him and went on to, to the next place. Where did you stay? Well, you, I, because I was with Oscar. Where were you were staying? Well, interestingly enough, I was st we were staying in the Beverly Hills of um, Port-au-Prince. And it was not Beverly Hills, but it was at the very sort of top of Port-au-Prince. So it's all on hills, and then you look down, and City Soleil is at the very base of it, right by the water, and that's sort of where all the garbage is collected and where they've literally built their houses on top of that garbage. And so we're up in this hill. Our driver would drive right to our front gate. He'd open up the door. We'd grab our cameras, we'd run outside, we'd close the gate, and we'd go into this apartment that was about the size of this stage, actually, mm -hmm. with a bathroom, uh, a loft, and uh, a pull-out couch and another bed. And so it was me and two other filmmakers on that trip, and we shared basically like a, a big studio apartment for, for Haiti. And it was quiet. We, you know, Once we were on sort of this little property, you felt safe enough, but Every morning, it was, you know, the car came, we got in the car fast because you didn't want people seeing you with equipment because then they'd just come and rob your house while you were out during the day. So it was, you know, you, at all times you were thinking about the fact that, yeah, something might happen here. And, you know, you, you didn't go to the ATM. This was the other thing we were told. You don't go to the ATM machine. If you do, someone shoots you in the face and they take your $300 that you just got out of the machine and they don't think twice about it. So that's like, that's the level of sort of fear that everybody puts into you before you even go there. And while I was there, you know, I didn't see anybody die or anything like that, but I never felt easy, you know. Right. I've, I've, wow. I've worked in, you know, different places uh, over the years where, you know, you might not feel safe, you're in a bad neighborhood. Bad neighborhood in the United States is nothing like what I saw in Haiti. Right. Did you shoot any footage of yourself shooting this footage? No, I try not to get meta. <laughs> um, every once in a while, you know, there's probably, I probably have some footage somewhere where you see a couple of the guys in a shot or something like that, but once I get into that, then it's like you're doing the making of the making of the making, and, you know, that'll be another three years, so. Well, the making is another film. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that I'd, that exactly. I'd like to see it, so yeah. interesting, Jesus. Um, but actually, so, let, me, let me tell you another story about uh, yeah. being over there. So, Towards the end, when, when we finished our trip over there, we had 
80% of the footage, it got down to where I called one of my editors, a, a kid by the name of Carl Breville, and Carl um, is from Haiti, and he grew up just outside City Soleil, so he used to walk past Father Tom's schools on his way to his school every day. And he came to me, I, when I first was looking for editors, I just, I literally put out a Craigslist ad and said, looking for editors to work for free on a project for Haiti, you know, all hands on deck kind of thing. And I had like nine different editors reach out. Wow. Carl being one of them, and Carl had just finished film school, so he was very green, but he was very passionate that he needed to do something to help with Haiti. And I was like, well, you know, he's the only Haitian working on the project, you know, let's wow. bring him on. And so he ended up editing the third movement, which I thought emotionally was the hardest movement. And so I gave it to him partly because I felt like you're going to be showing a lot of death and destruction in this movement. I feel like it should have some Haitian eyes on it that feel that it's not going overboard and being exploitive. Huh. And so that's why I gave him, him that movement. And, but as we got to the end and I had most of this footage, um, Carl then became my go-to guy. Um, his girlfriend worked for an organization, an NGO over in Haiti at the time. So he was gonna go back with her. And so he went out and got himself a black magic camera and, uh, and a drone and went back over to Haiti and I would email him shot lists and he would send me shots. I'd say, that's great, try to find me this. And he was there for six months while his girlfriend was there as well and actually didn't even leave, he left finally because his girlfriend got pregnant and they were very afraid of Zika. So they needed right. to come back to the United States immediately wow. to make sure that everything was okay. And they just had the baby like two months ago. So it all, it all worked out wonderfully. And uh, How was it for a woman being there? Was it m more dangerous or less? I mean, is well, that no, issue? you know, I think as far as like the volunteers and the NGOs, you're kind of running in a pack. You know, you're right. never, and you're really in this spot where you're trying to make a difference. And, you know, at nighttime, there are about three restaurants that you'd say, oh, we'd go out there and every NGO or expat that's over there, you'll see at these three restaurants because it's the only place that if anybody has money they, that you can really go to. And most Haitians aren't, you know, going out and buying dinner and buying beers for themselves in the right. evening. So um, it, was, it was definitely a very interesting sort of, way of life over there, but you could see the, the people that work in the NGOs, it becomes its own little thing, uh, almost a click, and you see the it, very different and interesting personalities that make up the kind of person that would go to a place so far off and try to make a difference for other people, and it's, it's a very specific type of personality that does right. that. So has this film been effective in, in making any kind of uh, a relief effort for Haiti? Or, you know, what, what is the plan going forward to, to make this really meaningful? Um, so, well, the, the first interesting thing, which probably needs to be talked about in a panel about music, um, is that my original idea was to make a record, make an album that sells and then donate the sales to, uh, to the organization. And it became painfully apparent that no one buys records anymore. Um, especially nobody buys records of orchestral music anymore. Um, so it didn't sell. So the first year, we had, we had this amazing day experience, this wonderful, very sort of, uh, all, everyone's hearts, hearts were in the right place. And at the end of the day, nothing happened. There was no, you know, the record was out, you can still get it on Amazon, but it didn't, there was no real money made. I said, well, we didn't get anything to right. the people who need it. Um, and so the year after we, we came up with, we said, well, how, how can we use this now? And so we did a, a live concert with a, a benefit concert downtown in Los Angeles um, that Lucas also conducted. Um, and that we had organizations and sponsors and uh, dinner and everything like that. And that, uh, that made about $150,000 in that one day when we premiered it live. So that plus about you know, 50 or so thousand at the, end, at the end of the day from donations and record sales, you know, we ended up giving about $200,000 uh, from the original path of the project. And but, that $200,000 went to Father Tom? Yeah, it went to or? Hands Together, which is the, the it's a 
whatever it is. C3. Five hundred one C three. Yeah, that it's a it's a it's based in Massachusetts, but they they work from Haiti. And um, and how and, does he get the the money distributed? Or so it's all it, they have schools. They have K through twelve schools, two schools, um, and they have uh, clinics and truck you know uh, medical trucks that that actually serve both city of Soleil slum as well as they they go out and they also do a lot of uh, agriculture and well digging and everything like that so all the money went to those functions went to pay the teachers went to um, they feed like I said they feed about 4,000 people a day um, rice and beans and things like that so it did buy, it bought food it bought books it bought um, it repaired some structures uh, with the school So some of what we're seeing in the in the film yes that has to do with construction and feeding and those kinds of things was a direct result I, of I think so yeah I mean or at least right. similar to that right um, but yeah, it wasn't immediate and it wasn't in the way we thought. Right. And then as far as what I see happening, which I think can be much, quite honestly, much, much more powerful, um, is the fact that now this, the score is available in, in the parts uh, and we made it available and we're going to actually make both the full version as well as um, versions that are more playable by student orchestras, by ensembles that are merely just strictly choir or strictly um, winds or, or, or winds and brass um, and so basically that's all free normally when when an orchestra says they want to play a night of John Williams's you know ET and whatever they have to then contact a company and rent that music and they rent the parts and they rent everything and it costs them money to to uh, to put that on so what we're hoping at this point is that we can now make this available for free and we will send them your music they can program it and as long as they share a portion of the ticket sales right. for any concert, you know, the Allentown, I'm from, I'm from Pennsylvania, the Allentown Symphony, the wherever, and, and what I'm really hoping is that this sort of expands exponentially to all sizes of, of ensembles and orchestra. And now with Brian's film, you know, my, my ideal situation would be that all over the world they're putting on weekends where perhaps on you know Saturday night they screen the movie and then Sunday night they Have the premiere the piece, the piece and they you know not only show everyone what happened get everyone talking and asking the right questions um, but also uh, be able to take some of the some of the funds that they raise from the performance and uh, and send that along so so I think that's our biggest goal is to to, to then have it spread and, and hopefully for, for many, many years to come, just be, be performed over and over again all over right. the world. Do you feel that, um, that the, your efforts on this project are in any way being diminished by all of the other disasters that have been befalling the world these days? I don't think so at all. I think, I mean, I, if anything, I think, you know, every one of these disasters is another stark reminder of how much poverty there is so close um, to the United States and how ill-prepared, you know, even, even in Texas and Florida, how ill-prepared all of us are for, you know, for dealing with, with real, you know, whether it's earthquakes or, or storms or hurricanes or fires. or fires or whatever, you know, all of a sudden, I mean, that's the one thing, you know, that we should talk about before we go is, you know, it's hard to watch this movie. And, and we recently cut some of this movie out even more because it's really difficult. What did you to, cut out? We cut out a lot. Honestly, we cut out a lot of quotes and talking, interviews with people who were at that day talking about how great it was, great it was or how much effort it was to record this project. How and, hard the music was, how long the day was, because it, it felt really, first world really self serving. Yes, it felt yeah. very, very first world. Problem. And and I think that and I didn't. No one, no one did the project with that in mind. But we all sat, kind of sat there and went, "Wait a second, this feels right. really it's disingenuous. Really smart. It feels really, it's weird. really smart to cut that." But out. I think what it does is it's, well, it had to be done. But I think even more importantly. You know, I, one of my friends from college just lost his house in Santa Rosa oh, with a fire. And, you know, and my a second grader at my daughter's school lost her mom in Las Vegas. Right. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's that that immediately just puts the off, touches the off button in any problem we could possibly have. Yeah. There's nothing that can be nearly as, as, as 
uh, traumatic and, 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 and really as tragic as people losing their homes, people losing their parents, people losing their kids. And, um, and so it was a real eye opener how, you know, to watch this and go, I feel really uncomfortable about this because nothing I'm worried about in my life is of any real value. Mm -hmm. I'm so blessed and I'm so lucky. And all I can, all I really want to do is use this and, and use these platforms. So whether it's actually, I mean, I personally have a connection to Haiti, but whether it's helping Haiti or Puerto Rico or Santa Rosa, I don't, I don't think it matters. I think, I think if anything, you know, and Lucas had a great quote about this, if anything, it's the concept of artists, creatives, and, hu and just human beings in general coming together yeah. and saying, how can we use our gifts that we were given to help those that are not as fortunate as us? Yeah. And that's it. And that's really the end of the story. What was your quote, Lucas? Or was that With it? I think you'll have to, oh, well, did I quote Bernstein in the, in the oh, movie? No, you didn't. Say the Bernstein quote. It's a good well, one. <laughs> um, th there's a, a meme that always comes up. Um, I, I had the great honor to, to study with Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein in the last 10 years of his life um, to know him. And um, after the assassination of J, uh, John F. Kennedy, he, he gave a speech to the United Jewish Fund um, uh, with the, basically the, the question, what can we as artists possibly do with our notes and our paints and our pencils and to, to uh, ameliorate um, the, the, the pain and the suffering in, in the face of tragedy. And he said, this will be our reply to violence, to make music more beautifully, more passionately, and more devotedly than ever before. And that's all we can do. That's, we just need to do what we do better and stronger and louder and, and, uh, and bring other people into the fold to, to, to help them um, feel that power of music and the power of community and that you're not alone in this. Mm. We should talk about the music school. That's a good segue. Can we do that? I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At the, what, you want to talk about the music school? Yeah. So at the end of the uh, movie, um, there's, uh, there's a section where um, we show a site of the future music school that we're trying to build in Haiti with more performances and with the funds from this. And that was a direct result that Doug and, uh, and Father Tom decided that they wanted to build a music school after they saw what the Symphony of Hope was all about and what it did. And, um, and I think the real reason for that is it, it gives a sense of purpose. It mm -hmm. gives a... You know, these so, I forget how what the number of orphans are, but it's it's sort of staggering. Staggering, the the percentage of kids who don't have parents. Um, In City Soleil, it's close to fifty percent. Close to fifty percent, I think, yeah. which is unbelievable. And and Do they all live in orphanages. Though? No, they live on the streets. On the street. There are there are, there are orphanages. orphanages there are, yeah. but Jesus. But what do you do? And, and 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 we see this even in L.A. with a lot of the charities that that we work with in LA that it's, it's absolutely amazing if someone's, if some young person's spark gets lit about whether it's playing an instrument or learning a, about an instrument or it being in a play or something, it can really give you a reason to keep going. And I think, uh, and I think that's what Doug and Father Tom saw is we need to build a place that's, that becomes a sense of community where children, adults, every, family, everyone can come and re and figure out why to keep why the, why they should keep trying um, in the midst of all this this poverty and despair and, and all their their troubles and um, and so there's a site for that they've already started there's two rooms uh, in a building where they're currently teaching music um, and they were they actually named it after my mom and dad without telling any of us or me, <laughs> so um, which was really cool and uh, so what is it called the Jim James and Josephine Leonard's Music, school of music, love and um, which is awesome, uh, but they want to build a full, a, a full, you know, two-story uh, place. I think it has mm -hmm. four, four performance rooms and a bunch of practice rooms yeah. to be able to teach lessons and have a choir and have a an orchestra and a band and and, and really create a space to start changing because that's really I think that's what's going to change any any country like mm -hmm. Haiti. 
um, it's not going to be an extra check and it's not going to really be an extra right. some sort of uh, you know piece of assistance or um, or a law or anything. I think it's going to be the next generation feeling like they have something to fight for. Yeah. Well, music has that incredible um, ability to to heal and change lives. I mean, you were one of the original board members of the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation this Chris, mm -hmm. and now you're on that board. But do you want to address that point about music education and what that does to be restorative for people? Well, I was just sitting here thinking that Haiti, as far as I know, still does not have uh, any public education. No. What? Not at all? None. No. It's, uh, I think it's the I'm last so country in the today. Western <laughs> world that has none. And so what Father Tom is doing with having education the thing about music education that we found in schools that the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation serves, uh, including in South Central Los Angeles, is that the, the change in uh, um, graduation rates and, uh, and attendance to the school when uh, a, 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 a child is involved in the music program it escalates. Uh, at one year, the, when we were working with uh, uh, the academy in, in South Central, they had a 100% graduation rate among their uh, music students. Mm -hmm. And the school was a little less than 40 overall, the general population of the school. So there's no question that the music and the arts education make a huge difference in, in people's lives. That there's a little tangent. We just worked with a director, a great guy, a guy called David Talbert. Um, he happens to be uh, African American, but he was asking this question about uh, an orchestra. Why, you know, there's there are lots of white people in this orchestra. You know, why why is that? And the answer isn't well. You know, they're not. You know, people of color and women are not let in. It's not that at all. It's education, and without that, the ability to, uh, especially in in uh, Title I schools in the United States and in other places around the world, without the ability to study music, you're not going to go into music because your parents don't have money to put you in private lessons like probably all of ours did. Uh, so it has to come from the schools. And so it is changing, but it has to change at that level, and it's changing slowly with organizations like the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation and VH1 and, and a, a few others, uh, 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 Education Through Music, and, uh, you know, they're making those changes. So it's, you know, I always like to say, it only takes 12 years, you know, that whole cycle of uh, <laughs> education, and that's not so long, really, when it comes to making grand changes like that. Yeah. And on that level, I just, I'll just to comment, the League of American Orchestras is, um, which is a kind of an umbrella organization for um, uh, orchestras around the country and in Canada, um, as a aiding orchestras to, to figure out how to deal with f uh, financial issues, administrative, uh, administrative, administrative issues, personnel, all kinds of things. Um, the diversity is uh, one of the largest issues that are um, being focused on right now. Um, and the Sphinx uh, organization is, um, has been um, a pioneer in this, giving opportunities and educating um, uh, um, uh, non-Caucasian um, uh, communities in classical music and making classical music and, and, and jazz and film music uh, relevant in um, these communities where they're not necessarily um, like the first go-to, mm -hmm. like well, like classical music. Well, that's for stuffy white people, um, but it, it's it's not just it. It's just about education. It's about oh well, you know what? If you're exposed to it, you'll you might like it. Yeah, good point. Exactly. Uh, do any of you have any questions? We've been yammering for an hour, but yes. To do like a cover, to take to take, yeah, to, to take a fame of a, a song that you know and have someone else sing it. Correct. 
Um, so it would be a, you would need publishing, you need to get the publishing rights from uh, whoever owned the publishing of that, to that song, and then you just have to make a separate deal with whoever your uh, artist is. But it's, yeah, so you, it would be... It's a sync license. It would be, it would be a sync, a sync sync synchronization license. license. But yeah, yeah, it's far easier, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Sure. Yeah. which I find so amazing. And I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about how, how that came about. Well, right, we'll do a sure. Yeah. Well, that I mean, there's a there's a skill set amongst the best recording uh, orchestras who sp specialize in film music, um, especially in uh, in Los Angeles and London uh, are the two sort of meccas for for that. And we, there are there's never rehearsal. Mm -hmm. There's never rehearsal for anything. Anytime you ever go to the movies, the the piece of music that you hear, whether it be Harry Potter or anything else. The first time they saw that was that day. They open it up and they play it. Yeah. Most of the time you're hearing the first, second, or third take. Yeah, I, By the yeah. time they get to the third take, it, they've instilled all the emotion yeah. uh, as if they've been playing it all their lives. It's, it's, an it's amazing. mind blowing. It's amazing That's talent. how good they are. Yeah. Yeah. So it's yeah. close to an hour's worth of music that we uh, um, did in six hours minus breaks. Yeah, right. <laughs> so what right. is that? So Sight reading. <laughs> yeah. Sight reading. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really a magnificent skill. And it's something that, that these particular uh, groups of players, um, the studio musicians in Los Angeles, the orchestras like the London Symphony and the Philharmonia and the ones in London, they, they have this innate ability not only to read the notes and play them correctly, but to very quickly emote in a way that feels like a very powerful emotional performance, not just a mechanical performance, which is uh, stunning, and that's why they're the, they're the best at it. It's, yeah. it's really, again, I, I sort of, I, I, I pinch myself every time I go into one of these recording sessions and I hear them play something I wrote for the first time. And I, it's, it's also they why they don't work for it. free. Yeah, exactly. And they <laughs> should, but, but it's practiced, amazing. Yeah. It really is amazing, yeah. Yes, in the back. Film scores now for TV series are played by real people, real orchestras, as opposed to music in a box. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna have to guess, but I would say depending on the the actual genre and and size of the pro of the product, I would say most. Most, if not all, of the big studio, most, if not all, of everything you see in a theater is most likely ha has a decent size, uh, real ensemble playing it. Um, the big, you know, the, the, the Wonder Woman's and the Harry Potter's and the Avengers, they all have full, those are all still full orchestra. Um, a lot more television, quite honestly, has, has become live again. There was a real long period of time where it wasn't. And it's, uh, you know, quite honestly, a lot of that thanks goes back to to J.J. Uh, Abrams, and, and he insisted uh, from the very beginning on, because uh, he's such a fan, he insisted that Alias and Lost had live orchestras, and all of a sudden everyone started really realizing, like, wow, that, that makes a big difference. And, and in the when you're spending three or four million dollars on an episode of television, and you can, you know, an orchestra probably, you can probably score an episode with, they were probably spending... 50, 40 to fifty thousand dollars to record the music. When you think about the relationship, I mean that's that's a pretty amazing investment to be able to have your 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 the emotion that that provides. So that's that's come really back into style. A lot of television is done with uh, with live orchestras now. Um, and I think um, you know as far as even indie movies, I think a lot of a lot of the even the even the, the smallest budgets are still using smaller ensembles. When you think about somebody like a John Bryan, who who's fantastic, you know, and he'll do something like I Heart Huckabees or or um, or Eternal Sunshine, where it's you know it's probably seven musicians, but it's seven real people taking. And whenever you have real musicians playing, you you get the value of all of their hearts and souls and yeah. decades of of. Of music, and you put you multiply that, so you got times seven. You got seven really deep musical souls all contributing, and I think uh, I think there's a there's an awesome value in that. And I, I feel like for the most part, a lot of music is is sort of being done live still. You know, 
I can give you a number. I, I've done over 200 films, and I would say around 10 of them uh, didn't have some musicians playing on it. And that might be an exaggeration. It might be less. It's and that's even through the, you know, the bad periods. So. so there's been a bit of a renaissance, actually. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's good. Yes. I'm uh, sorry I didn't see the film yet. Uh, sure. But uh, for Christopher, um, you said that uh, to, to get the composers, uh, to give them, uh, you had started with some Haitian music. Was that traditional music? And what was the, uh, the musical language that, the, that you wanted from the composers? Is it so that for them, is there a certain vocabulary that you wanted to um, the, the traditional song was a folk song, and the recording that I had found of it was uh, guitar and voice. It was someone singing over the guitar? Um, but I didn't put any, I di I didn't put any um, specific direction on the music. I think the fact that I called it a symphony of hope, I think everyone just sort of started moving in a classical orchestra direction. But, uh, but for example, the... Um, the uh, the section that uh, Tyler Bates wrote, who did Guardians of the Galaxy, and he plays guitar with Marilyn Manson, uh, yeah. he's a wonderful, wonderful composer and a really great guy. And so he used uh, uh, something called a guitar viol in his section, which is uh, which is you know elect an electric guitar that you play almost like a cello. Um, and so so he expanded into that. Um, whereas uh, a composer Debbie Lurie wrote, um, she decided that she wanted to write for someone that she knew really well, and she uh, hired this woman, Carmen Twilley, who, uh, if you guys know the name Carmen Twilley, Carmen Twilley sang Circle of Life at the beginning of Lion King. Um, that's her voice, and, and so she called Carmen and asked, said, would you sing this for me? So her section became a very um, earthy, organic, um, solo vocal setting but the um, uh, for instance the the second movement which is the destruction and the earthquake um, in a cinematic way um, uses the composers who wrote for that did use um, more contemporary classical techniques to to illustrate um, with more dissonance and more you know that sort of thing what was going on um, uh, but but for the most part it is all it's all tonal um, throughout uh, and uh, uh, just with, with various extended compositional techniques involved. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, this is more of a comment. Um, uh, I'm an assistant principal administrator in a high school in the New York area, and to package this, the composition with the film, would be very impactful on a high school level, and, and you could even compare it with curriculum. And I think in part, when you mentioned that earlier, that would be a powerful way, as you were saying, start with the kids and you get, you bring awareness with young high school kids going to college and I think that's another way, because this is a brilliant way of doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. And then they're relating it to the music, which is, makes it just much more emotional. And our, our plan is actually to, uh, it is almost an hour's worth of music, but but that's hard to right. to do, so we will be cutting it down and and creating a, a more manageable version um, that goes along with with visuals. And, uh, and if you give me your email when this is done, I'll send you a link so you can show your students. Yeah, that's great. Yes. Um, two things. In the movie, there's a point where the cello player is talking about the distractions of the cameraman, <laughs> and I know there's no uh, rehearsal. But he seemed to talk about takes. So were there was it a continuous play of the whole piece, or did you have to stop and redo? Well, the idea of, of no rehearsal is is perhaps a slight exaggeration, <laughs> because the first time you're reading it, that's sight reading, and then the second time is rehearsal, and the third time is hopefully the recorded take. However the tape is rolling the entire time. We record everything. Because if, if they're in the booth and they say, that sight reading was fabulous, we're moving on, then we move on and there is no rehearsal. So it really just depends on the complexity of, of the music and the moment and, and uh, the moving of all the moving parts and how we can uh, cohesive we can get as quickly as possible. But I would say there wasn't more than, I, I don't think there was ever more than Three, no. three times through any section. And, and what was also remarkable that the, the sound 
the stage at uh, Warner Brothers is very large, and the the sixty voices the choir was way in the back, and they were looking at um, the printed out choral part, which had no reference to where they were in the music, except for, okay, now we're gonna rest for 40 bars. But they weren't, they had no clues as far as like, okay, we're gonna come in on an E or a G sharp. or anything. So they were remarkable and they were very far away and they were in sync. It was just, it was amazing. They had their own choral director? No, I was conducting them you from a very far distance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. What about PBS? And have you, gentlemen, and maybe seen a piece called Joseph's Violin? Joe's, yeah. Joe's Violin. Joe's yeah. Violin, because that's right what you were talking about. Yeah. Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation was involved in the placement of that particular violin, so yeah, we've so, seen it. Yeah. yeah, as far as PBS goes, um, PBS has this thing about you raising money off of your broadcast. They don't like you to do it. They need to raise money for themselves. Uh, so when public. you when you have something that is raising money for something else, um, they're Split not interest. they're not interested. It's yeah. uh, it's because you know if they're serving the public, are they serving the public by just trying to help raise money for Haiti for this one organization? That's what it sort of comes down to. Mm -hmm. um, it, it'll end up having a, a, a digital platform for sure. Uh, you, you know, I, my guess is you'll be seeing it on iTunes and Amazon Prime and stuff like that. Um, and you know, we'll we'll find a home for it so it gets seen on TV somewhere. Yeah. Yes. Question for Brian: When you went to Haiti yourself, or when you um, had other photographers going to Haiti and you were giving them um, uh, instructions on the type of images you were looking for, what kinds of instructions would you give them? Like, well, er, early on it was bring back whatever you can, can find for me. Whatever you're able to shoot, bring it back. And so I started sort of with this wide swath and I didn't yet know truly what I needed for each section. So I got footage back and you look at it and some of it worked, some of it didn't, some of it we tried to make work and eventually you get honest with yourself and realize that it didn't work and you start looking for other things. Eventually by the end, I got, got it down to where I knew tempo-wise what I needed. I needed a three-second cut here. I needed a five-second cut here. And so the way I then cut the film was I put different color bars for each spot that I needed something. So it would go from a blue color bar to a red color bar to a green color bar so that I knew where I had footage and where footage needed to be put in and how long I needed that footage to be so that I could then say, I need you to find more of the beauty of your country and I need the shot to be four seconds long and seven seconds long and nine seconds long. So make sure you hold that shot long enough so that I have the material. And he would shoot things, but not necessarily know if, you, if I was really gonna use it for that purple spot or that green spot. But we would then go through and we would take out more stuff and then I would put up another cut for him and he could then see what was missing and say, all right, I need those five shots or still we're looking for something for that area. And so, um, you know, like we got things at the end where because Carl was from Haiti, there's in, I think it's the last group of hope where he was basically brought into the spontaneous drum circle that just happened and out of nowhere basically the gangs in this neighborhood all decided to get together and throw a drum circle and I could have never gotten that footage no. like not in a million years but here was just another guy from Haiti with a really small little camera here on his shoulder and he was able to just live there amongst them for a few minutes to really get me some stuff that I, I could have never gotten wow. um, you know and there was the the stuff where he caught some kids that were jumping off of a waterfall. Um, that was some beautiful stuff. And yeah. you know, he took me into parts of the country that you don't get to see when you yeah. first go there. And so I felt, you know, I, I certainly saw the worst of Haiti. Yeah. Um, and, Car and Carl brought me, I think, the best of Haiti. Brilliant to see the beauty there too. Yeah, 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 no, he really, he was able to say, you know, my country has a lot of beauty and this is where it is. And yeah. went out and found it and nice. gave it to us. Lucky. Yes. Working on a project that's so built with integrity and powerful, and you can see a direct connection to the work you're doing. Um, 
did anybody experience like a transformation in terms of like where is my personal career going, on the trajectory, <laughs> what I'm going to do next with my life? Did, was it was it transformative in that nature? For me, I'll, I'll, I'll speak for me first. You guys can. Um, I, I think uh, the first thing is that I, I spent almost six and a half years from beginning to end being a part of this artistic process. So I, for me, the transformation was, okay, I've really spent a lot of time doing something good, so the next one's going to make me some money. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think I, I definitely, you know, I, I'll piggyback of that, on that, in in terms of, I feel like I made a, I made I've made a very conscious decision since this, knowing in that sort of selfish way of how it made me feel good that if I don't do something, like this on a regular basis, you know, I, I do I work with Mr. Holland's Opus, I work with another charity called Education Through Music, both of which bring bring music to uh, underprivileged schools. Uh, if I don't do stuff like that on a relatively consistent basis, I, don't, I feel yeah. empty a little, a little bit. I feel a little empty. Um, but then I also, I have a, um, an, an amazing, I have a life coach. I know that sounds very Los Angeles to everybody. But, uh, but I, you know, I call him Yoda because he's really this, this amazing, amazing sort of spiritual um, advisor and, uh, and one of the things he did say that he's discovered with a lot of people who are artists and people who are, you know, whether successful in, in whatever part of the career they have is it doesn't help you to then go, okay, I'm going to go be a hermit now. And, you know, because of, of this, you know, the platform is, is better served if I do keep doing work for bigger movies. And I can ask more people who work with me on those bigger movies to come to these events to help me get this thing mounted, to help me, um, uh, you know, do more projects like this. Um, so, you know, is there is there a, a, an equation in my head that says doing Bad Moms too somehow allows me to help throw the gala to try to get another, you know. 5,000 recorders in kids' hands who can't, who otherwise wouldn't have music, that's an equation that, that happens a lot. That, mm -hmm. That's exactly what goes through my head. And, uh, and, and so I do it that way. And, uh, on the, uh, on a never, another turn on that, um, as a conductor, with my conductor hat on, uh, conductor music is, is recreation of what other people have done. And if you're, uh, for me, this is not for all my colleagues, I cannot speak for them, but for me, if my um, sole intent in conducting concerts is to uh, please, please, please um, get people to, to sit down in a dark hall for two hours and listen to me, um, uh, to, to our, me and my colleagues make music, um, uh, that's not quite enough. I know that there is a reason for doing concerts. I know that, that it brings solace and it's, and, it, and it's a moment of focus and quiet and, and excitement and, and uh, all that good stuff. But at the same time, I know that there's so many more things that we can do with music. And what, what I um, continue to do, and I, I devote a lot of my life to music and wellness and, and, and uh, starting these kinds of programs and music and education because that's, if, if we're not focused on the things outside of the concert hall, then we're never going to get people back into the concert hall. Yeah. I think it's important, you know, to, to do something. I used to do these lunches in New York called um, Film Music in the Bigger Picture. And we would have, you know, different speakers from different philanthropic endeavors come and speak. I'd spend the same dollars having, you know, networking lunches for film music community people in, in town, but we'd lay on this other layer of, you know, a platform to talk about something meaningful. So we had a speaker one year talking about, it was another Haitian project, actually something Wyclef Jean was involved with years back when he was, you know, using gangbanger techniques to get relief effort into Haiti. And I had Stuart Copeland with me, who I'd I actually had him here a couple of years ago, but he was um, just on the verge of 
the police reforming to do another tour. And he was sitting there watching what Wyclef was doing and he looked at me and he said, I should be doing something. And I thought, ding, you know, that's exactly why I do these lunches. And I said, yeah, you should, you know, what do you want to do? And he said, I don't know, I'd want to purify the water supply for some third world nation that, you know, it's that, that needs help on that basic of a level. I said, that's great. What do you know about purifying water supplies? He goes, nothing. I said, okay, so I recruited him at that point. We're all involved with the Mr. Holland's Opus Foundation. I put him on the board for that for a while. But while he was doing that, the police were making plans to go out on this tour. And, you know, sure enough, it ended up being the biggest tour of the year that summer. And the closing concert that the police ended up doing was at Madison Square Garden. And it was a fundraiser for whatever the organization was that they found that purifies the water supply for some third world nation. So, you know, the point is, is in life and in all the projects and in all the work we all do, you got to just throw the seeds out, you know, and see where they plant themselves and, and just live your life on, on that, with that duality that you can do your work, you can score your sausage party movies, you can do whatever it is you do to feed your family and make your life good. But I think we all um, make the world a better place, not to sound too hopelessly optimistic. If you, if you just think mindfully about, you know, how you can add a layer to that, that'll do some good somewhere in the world. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think maybe that's a good note to leave things on since yeah. we're out of time anyway. Thank you so much for coming and thank you. What a beautiful project. And Lucas is trying to say. I just wanted to mention, I'll, I'll um, have the score down here if you want to take a look at it. Uh, it's on the stage down here, just a thumb through. And thank is there you. anything else you want to tell them about uh, website addresses or anything that they can do to support this um, if they want to? Sure. So, uh, www.hadysymphony.com is, uh, is our website. You can see the trailer for the movie, I believe, on there. Um, you can also find links to buy the album. Uh, please buy the album. And then uh, there is, um, I believe it's on there, but there, uh, there is an a, a email address that you can send if you have, that would be my, my hope, if you have any connection to a local symphony, a local um, choir, orchestra that might be interested in performing it, um, let us know. We'll send you, we'll get, get us in touch with whoever their music director is or whatever, and we'll find a way to send them the music so we can get it performed and, and right. raise some more money. Great. Thank you, and good luck with this film. I think it's beautiful and important, and I'm so proud of all of you for doing it. And thank, thank you, you for coming. Thank you.